boom, put a 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 boom, A side, B side, what side are you on? Well, oh, I can do it this week. Yeah, your voice is sounding Maybe. much better. <laughs> I'm at like 90, I'd say 96%. I still have a bit of a cough and um, I'm not like congested or anything, but I feel like I'm not congested, but there, I can still feel some in my sinuses. If that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's winter and you were yeah. just in the great, the great North. So, you know, it's even more winter up there. I got to tell you, it's colder here in Nebraska than it was in Buffalo, New York. Really? Yeah. Fair but there's more snow in Buffalo. Way more snow. But just yeah. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but uh, I got to go home and visit with my mom and my kids were there. So see my stepdad and um, it was just a really good time. There was lots of snow, but I did get to end the bills. Long, but um, yeah, did get to eat some fabulous Buffalo food like pizza. And there's a hot dog place back there. Ted's that I adore and have to visit every single time I go home. And then mom cooked and. Oh, is there a like is there a traditional buffalo hot dog topping like you know like the chicago dog and then you've got like chili dogs in some places is there a traditional like do they just like put buffalo wing sauce on it or something no but this one particular place has their own version of like a, a hot relish oh like a hot sauce so when you're like hey and you walk in and they grill it right in front of you there's those big grill top and so you walk nice. in, you tell them what you want, and then they just do it right in front of you. And then when you're asking for things, they've got like ketchup, mustard, relish, pickles, onions, and then you can do the hot sauce, which is like a combination of some kind of a hot sauce in their relish. You see, I prefer my hot dogs to have just been slowly rotating on those strange <laughs> wheel, those straight, same circular things for like three and a half hours. Right. I, that's when you that's when you get like the true hot dog flavor, when it's just been sitting there in like the world's worst sauna for like three hours. It's like sweating. Yeah, yeah. Cause I, I, I want I wanted to sweat out the bad. You know, it's just like a sauna. Sweat out the bad, it was the good, get those toxins out of the hot dog, and then it, it and it's just pure kosher. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Totally could see that. Totally could see that. But uh, yeah, it was a good time. It was a really good time. And just to be able to see everybody, you know, at the same time, you know, I know my youngest lives with me, but my oldest, I don't really get to see her often. I don't get to see my mom and my stepdad often. So it was really sweet. It was really nice. Yeah. It is awesome to get everybody together. And it ended up getting through January, which evidently felt like it was seven weeks long this year. I know January did feel really long and then it was also my birthday last week so that was that was the actual reason that we went we went for my birthday but like even just getting to my birthday which is the second last week of the month I was like are we are we still in January like what is going on it is still and it's not even that long a month. like it's yeah it's I guess the longest is 31 days but it just feels so much longer I don't know why but now February is gonna fly by because it feels so short uh, so I have to ask, since you know we we talk about movies a lot on this uh, on this podcast, you successful, you know, career woman returns to her hometown over the holidays. I do not uh, fall in love with a baker or a farmer. You no, know, no Hallmark movie moments. No, no, no former, no former flames that you ran no, into. No, no, no pizza maker that. Um, you know, is trying to save the town with his famous pizza crust or anything like that. I was like, maybe, maybe at Ted's, there's like a guy who's really good at grilling those hot dogs that you, got, you had, you know, pre-calc with. <laughs> you, all, all, you, know, you always, he always lets you borrow that TI-85. It was, you know, it was a little love struck. <laughs> no, unfortunately did not happen. But dang it, now that you put it in my head, I'm kind of bummed. Well, I, you know, I'm trying to live vicariously here. So you know, I, I, I was like, we, we are like, Two thirds into a paragraph about this lifetime movie, I'm just waiting on you know the plot twist. <laughs> Unfortunately, like and oh, we saw Dancing with the Stars while I was there. And dang it, maybe one of the dancers would have seen me. He spotted me in the audience, and he was like, "Her," and brings me on the stage, and we dance and follow up. But that didn't happen either. Dang it. Yeah, Dancing with the Stars, Dancing with the Stars competitions are always dangerous. Man. I guess I didn't have that great of a time now. <laughs> oh, no, it's a great time. Don't say it. I'm just, 
<laughs> I'm just, I'm just trying to, I'm just projecting here. <laughs> How was your week? Uh, it, it was good. Uh, I'm so glad that January is done. Uh, it, we got a nice little like Arctic blast of cold. So it was one of those weeks where the dog wants to go outside and is so excited to go outside and we're going down the stairs and it's happy, happy, happy. We get outside and all of a sudden we turn around and there's this look of betrayal on their, their face. Like, why did you bring me out here? Mm-hmm. This is horrible. Mm-hmm. And then you realize that they got to do both number one and number two. But as soon as they're done with number one, they've decided, nope, my feet are too cold. But I get that. If I had to go, if every time I need to go to the bathroom, I had to go outside and stick my business in a snowbank, I would not be that excited to go outside. <laughs> right, right. So I, ha- I have to do this thing when I know that Lorelai, who's my pup, needs to go twice and she's got to do both. I got to go inside and then pretend I'm excited that we're going back outside again, Connor. So like, we'll go outside, do one, we'll come running back here. We'll like walk around in a circle that we'll go back outside again and do the second. So there's a lot of trips out and that didn't even always work because Lorelai is smart enough to know that I am a sucker. And sometime or I've had her for gosh, so 2000, like six years, seven mm-hmm. years. Mm-hmm. I think it'll be seven on Father's Day this year. And she knows that one time in the past, she picked up a paw like she, like it was injured. And I like immediately freaked out and picked her up and carried her inside. So now when she gets cold, she just does, she does the paw thing. and kind of looks at me like, oh, I'm injured. Please carry me. And I'm like, you're not, you're fine. Come on. <laughs> so she knows how to play me. Lots of trips in and outside. I've been doing, doing lots of work from home. I haven't been going out because it's just like stupid cold. Uh, and everything is frozen. And I, you know, I, my main mode of transportation is walking. And I love my na- my walkable neighborhood, except when the walkable neighborhood is like an ice slip and slide. Right. Just, you know, just walking to work or the grocery store. I, I look like, you know, I'm doing the funny walk for Monty Python because his legs <laughs> are flying left and right. You know, f- suddenly I've got wings. I'm trying to keep my balance like I'm on the trapeze. So lots, <laughs> lots of staying inside. Uh, but that has led to a lot more binging in the last week. So at that, I had been kind of falling off because of all the sports and all the work and the travel that I've been doing. And it hadn't been really up to my previous binging levels. I mean, my my phone, you know, you get the weekly screen time update and both on my phone and my iPad, which when I'm home, they are both within hand, arm's length at all times. Mm-hmm. Both of them last week were like down 27%. And I think wow. I was about to get an email from Apple being like, you know, we were going to do a Wells's check. Are you okay? Right. Because you're not watching, you're not using our devices nearly enough. Uh, we're concerned. You're it's really dropped off. But this week was way back up. That's good. They and were I like, was oh, very you're excited. Fine. You're fine. I was like, oh, he's back. He's back. Thank God. We need that ad, that ad revenue from that one guy. My, my favorite, they're like, no one is watching Murder She Wrote. What is happening with that? <laughs> no, we, our numbers are way down. No one is binge watching Murder She Wrote four hours a day. So there must be something going on. Uh, I know I know it's tough now that, that uh, Jessica Fletcher is, is no longer with us, but stuff. Uh, so I've been watching a lot of stuff. And before I accidentally start the A-side, I'm about, mm-hmm. I was about to just segue in. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are on episode... 122. 122. So it's okay. I, it I is okay. Cool. Yes. Excellent. So let us segue right into the A-side. And I am very excited about the A-side this time. You can probably tell by the sound of boyish glee in my voice. Because mm-hmm. uh, it's going to be a, a two-part. I want to talk about something that we have mentioned before on the A-side, an update. Okay. And okay. then uh, another brand new show that I discovered this witch. This this witch. You know, this that's, you know, up here in Minnesota, we call Weeks Witch. Uh, that's not a thing. I, I just missed it. <laughs> this week that I found a brand new show and in the last three days I've binge watched the entire first season uh, and I'm already on to season two. I'd oh, never wow. heard of it before, stumbled upon it, have really enjoyed it. Uh, and it has also open, reminded me of an untapped gem of, not that we need more content sources, but there are there's one that I don't think we've ever really talked about that mm-hmm. is out there on various streaming services that, Every time I stumble upon a, a series from this provider, I enjoy it and I want to want to watch more. And I feel like it's something that, you know, people think about the BBC. I think I know and, what you're going to say because I have the same exact sentiment and so I thought, thought the same thing after binging something on it this week. Go ahead. Yeah. So that's going to be part two. But for first, part one, I want to do an update on a show that we talked about, uh, the original version. And then when we talked about it, we also mentioned, I think this was last uh, either last summer or last fall 
probably somewhere in, in the late 90s, uh, early 100s of the episodes, uh, where we're talking about a former great sitcom that is being rebooted. And it has now come out. Oh, uh, yeah. And you're able to you're able to binge watch. I think the first four episodes are already available. It's streaming. It's out Tuesday nights on NBC. And then ne- next day, it's streaming available on Peacock. And it is the brand new reboot or conti- not really reboot, continuation. I would mm-hmm. say of Night Court, mm-hmm. and I, you know, we've talked about my love for the original series for years and how excited and yet apprehensive I was that this was happening. Uh, but it is so well done. Uh, really, the, the new, it really is. And I don't know if it's just they found the right people and they brought back the right people. If they the, the creators and writers, so you've got it's starring Melissa Roche, who was uh, Bernadette on Big Bang Theory mm-hmm. uh, for so many years. Uh, hilariously, Lorelai, my dog, Zeppeli, has heard that I'm talking about her, so she's just thrown all of the pillows off the bed in protest. Oh, she's a that big, I'm using... big Melissa fan? Uh, well, no, she, I think she's just annoyed that I'm using her for content without permission, so oh. <laughs> uh, we'll probably have a talk later. She's giving me the evil eye and just just, kicked, just literally pushed all the pillows off the bed to make room for her. Uh, so, Melissa Roch from, uh, and it might be Rauch? I R A U C H. I'm yeah, not sure either because I, I, I was just Ra- seeing it in the credit. I think I said Rauch, but I don't know exactly how to say it. Yeah, there was, a, there was a baseball player with the same spelling, and he was John Rauch. So I'm mm. just going with that. Okay. Uh, she stars as the daughter of uh, Harry Stone, who's now the new judge at Night Court. Uh, the only returning member of the series is John Lorraquette, who mm. the John Lorraquette show in the late 90s was highly underrated as well, and I really enjoyed mm. that. And mm. I kind of love what they've done with his character of Dan Fielding, where He's so good at sitcoms and this very specific type of, you know, 90s sitcom, uh, you know, with the one-liners and the, 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 the asides and, you know, situational comedy, almost sketch to a way because, you know, you've got the Night Court, which has all these weird, in, you know, guest people that are coming, all the criminals that are happening and all the easy jokes that come from side gags and that sort of things. And there's birds in the ceiling. And there's, you know, all sorts of, of just wacky stuff. But he's perfect because he's often, his jokes are often so, you know, deadpan and, und- and you know, understated kind of as an as a counterpoint to the wackiness of the show uh but dan rubin who created uh the unforgettable kimmy schmidt uh-huh. which which starred uh the redhead from the office and mm-hmm. he was also involved with parks and rec so the the lead characters of both of those shows there is there's a stylistic vibe that goes into melissa rouch's character uh Abby Stone in in the the show as well but what has been really impressive and what's the thing I was probably most scared of is taking a show you know from 30 years ago and updating it and making it still funny and not just the same thing they Mm -hmm. they do a good job with the setting and the site site jokes they're also doing a better job of kind of talking about the legal system as a whole Okay. and how how it serves people in a very subtle way i mean it's certainly not like an examination of you know court in our time or you know recidivism or how people deal with you know making mistakes and going through you know life changes and you know especially the character of dan fielding which in the original one was a very stock two-dimensional lecherous guy that hit on everything that moved it was just sort yes. of like the prototypical male stock creep like the sort of lecherous guy character and now you've got that same character who has gone through this transformation over 30 years and has grown and has changed and you know they used to be the prosecutor with the the aggressive wit thought everybody was evil and now abby convinces him to come back and work in the court as the public defender and that oh. simple change of role mirrors the change in the character and what they've gone through over 30 years of getting married and having a you know having this this great love of their life if they say they're losing them to an illness and now being single is older man going you know still in the workforce but trying to find his way um mm-hmm. there's a lot of, of really interesting moments that show more depth to it than mm-hmm. i was expecting when i when i first wrote i feared it was going to be really surface and it wasn't going to be you know good uh but, yeah. but i 
Yeah, I've been watch binge watched all four episodes in a row. They're 20 minutes long. They go super quick. It feels very much like an old style sitcom. It's got, you know, they're they're trapped in the courtroom. Most of it happens in the courtroom or maybe, you know, the lunchroom or an office, you know, but they're they're not traveling all over the place. It's not a big set. It's not, you know, wide ranging. It's very contained within those walls. And so far it's been been really good. Uh, I am excited to to see more. And you know, another one uh, just uh, it came out today, I believe, uh, or maybe that was the fourth one. They come out on they premiere on Tuesdays. They come out on Peacock on Wednesday, so I always watch them on Peacock. But very much looking forward to where it goes, and hopefully people will check it out. Um, and it's on Peacock live action. If you like the original, you will enjoy this one. If you liked, you know, Parks and Rec or the Unforgettable Kimmy Schmidt or you know, Unbreakable, an Unbreakable. Kimmy Schmidt. That, that's what I was doing. Wrong. I was like, and who's Kimmy Schmidt? The unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. If you like those, you'll like this. It's very much that style. It's not, I was afraid it was going to feel a little bit too much like Big Bang Theory, which wasn't my favorite style. Mm-hmm. Um, just the way they pace their shows and sort of thing. But this doesn't feel like that. It feels very much like the original style of Dark Night Court. And they're doing a great job of creating an homage, but also making it new and updated and delving into characters a little bit deeper than you probably expect from a almost you know slapsticky 20 minute show so right. that's the update on our last uh we mentioned them in a previous episode and you can check it out my new thing that i am very excited about is a brand new show that i stumbled upon completely uh, out of the blue uh and i was trying to find something new to watch and uh, i was kind of excited about this new series on netflix called lockwood and co about our lockwood and company it's about basically kids fight you know ghost busting uh Mm -hmm. but in england and it's very british and i was like ah it's like 2 a.m i can't sleep do i really want to put ghost visuals in my brain my brain's already got enough scary stuff in there and i know it's it's only tv 14 so it's not a horror thing but it's definitely gonna have some jump scares and some some creepy crawlies so i was like i got about 15 minutes into that i'm like oh this looked really interesting but i'm not gonna do it tonight so i had to find something else i'm like i need something i can just kind of check in on interesting not comedy because I'm I'm in sort of I was in a sort of serious mood. I've already burned through all of the the new American National Treasure series on Disney Plus. That's really good. Uh, I thought about doing Star Wars, uh, Bad Batch, the new you know cartoon Star Wars. And I was like, I just not mood. I just want something different. And so I started bouncing around. And I've been looking at the same streaming services, and I rarely like I'll get into one streaming service and just be stuck there for like, like three weeks, and then. I'll be like, okay, I don't feel like I see anything new. I'm going to have to go to a different one. Mm-hmm. And one that I often forget about is who. And now now that I'm back to who, I'm probably going to get stuck here for like the next three weeks. But I stumbled upon a, another legal show because I was looking for something that was sort of the interesting, but was going to be a different flavor than Night Court. And it's from 2019. And I'm like, why have I never heard of this show? This looks like something like I tend to like these you know, courtroom shows. There was part of me that at one point wanted to be a lawyer. I have my paralegal certification that I got and never used because that's a great way to spend money at them. Uh, and because <laughs> I moved out of the state. But I like legal dramas. And so I see this legal drama. And it's called Burden of Truth. And I'm like, wait a second. How have I never heard of this show? And the reason that I have never heard from it. And it, this has happened with several other streamings or se- several other series I've stumbled upon that I've really liked and watched every episode of. It was that it was originally a Canadian broadcasting company series. Oh. So it was developed in Canada. It's set in Canada. And it eventually comes to the US. The CW is famous for this. They just did it with Family Law, which is another legal drama that uh, stars... Uh, the the dad from Alias and Kaylee from Firefly as a family of lawyers that are working together. That one's pretty good. Uh, but this one stars Christina Crook, who was on Smallville, uh, and then who I thought was going to be a gigantic star. At one point, I did uh, too. she yeah, like she was supposed to be like the breakout star from that series, and it just doesn't seem to have ever really happened. She's been out, she's been around. The last time that I saw her in anything was in the most recent uh the first season of reacher where she has a small part as you know basically the mom of of the the main guy who's in trouble uh but i hadn't seen her in anything she was on the beauty and the beast series for a while i hadn't seen her since beauty and the beast yeah beauty and the beast was 2012 to 2018 so i guess right after beauty and the beast took a year off and jumped into burden of proof and immediately what i found interesting about the series so it's it's a legal drama and it stars 
Christina Crook as a hotshot, you know, lawyer from Toronto who is on the up and up. She's working at this firm. Her father's a lawyer. She is, you know, cold and calculating, sort of all the bad, you know, lawyer jokes, you know. They even, like, I think somebody out of a joke in one of the episodes, they used the classic lawyer joke, like, how do you know that a lawyer is, uh, uh, is lying? Huh. Their lips are moving. Ah. Yeah, so classic lawyer joke. But the entire first episode, she's set up as the bad guy. She's coming, she's a big hotshot lawyer coming from Toronto, going to her former hometown, a small town in Manitoba, where she left, you know, abruptly when she was a you know, 17, 18 year old in high school and hasn't ever gone back, talked to nobody and has left this in the past. And she comes back to the town to represent a pharmaceutical company that is, you know, a group of girls are sick and, and the town thinks that the pharmaceutical company's vaccine clinic just opened up. And the HPV vaccine is what gave, that made all these girls sick and gave them what appears to be a neurological disorder, which presents itself as, as ticks and shakes and tremors uh, and twitches and things like that. So she shows up basically going against these high school kids who are all you know suffering and their lives are getting taken away from them. She's representing the big bad pharmaceutical company. And so for the entire first episode and kind of the first couple episodes, the main character is not made to be very likable, mm -hmm. which is so strange for a TV series. And it and that really brought me in because I was like, really? We're, we're doing this? We're the entire first episode, she's going to win and these kids aren't going to, you know, they're, they're going to lose and then she's just going to leave town again and, and clearly is the bad guy. But because they set it up that way, it makes the, the arc of the entire first season a lot more interesting. Because instead of it being these these stock good and bad characters, you get to see her transformation and her journey through things and the people of the town's journey as well as, it, as they try to figure out what's making the, the kids sick and then also litigate that and figure it out, go through the, the entire process. And it's very in, involving. And the, and the best, the thing that I loved about it most is what I like to call the, the Han Solo character. I think Star Wars works best because there's Han Solo sitting there and Luke, to an extent, basically going, I don't understand what's happening. Please explain it to me. And so they have to set the stage for a character within the show. And because the, the girls in the story are all teenagers that do not know law, they spend a lot of the time being very clear about the process and why they're doing what they're doing and the legal terminology and de if defining everything, but not in a you know clinical way. Mm -hmm. But in a way that makes it feel like you are also learning about why the process and why are we doing what we're doing? What's going to happen and, and what's the difference between an injunction and when we're trying to turn it from a lawsuit into a class action, what do we have to do? And explaining those little things made it a lot more accessible for me as an audience member mm -hmm. and super drew me in. Uh, again, I always thought that Christina Crook was going to be a much bigger star. For some reason, she never really transitioned out of the CW world uh, and now is doing this stuff, which is in Canada, but then getting replayed on CW because eventually... CW bought it and it was part of their summer programming where they buy something from Canada and they just you know play it as a summer series in the U.S. because nobody's seen it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it the entire first season was really good. There is sort of a hinted romance between her and you know the the lawyer, the small town lawyer that she works with. But they do such a good job of keeping it there but not there. They never mm -hmm. they never take the. I kept waiting for the detour where oh. It's going to be now that they, now they, they finally fall in love or they finally kiss. And it, it, but not, it was there. It was tension that happened. But it was always the focus was on the case. And that made it really enjoyable because I was afraid often they were going to diverge to, to some you know romance offshoot. And we'll see what happens in season two, three, and four. But so far, it seems to be very focused where we've got relationships and we've got tension, but they're not giving in to the easy thing, which is to make the two main characters and their tension the entire story. It's just mm -hmm. one element of a bigger mystery, of a bigger legal battle. And of course, her father's involved and there's a lot of you know of his background. Why did they leave when, when she was a teenager in the middle of the school year, basically the middle of the night without telling anybody why they cut their life off completely and never come back to this town? Uh, why is her mother estranged from her? Uh, what is her father's history with this town and why is, you know, is he hated? Uh, and it's engrossing. They're all about 40 minutes is the type of thing that I can have on while I'm doing something else. I'm, I'm making dinner or I'm taking a break from spreadsheets and I just need to like let, take my brain away. Uh, it's been 
a delight to have found. And mm-hmm. that also made me think clearly because another Canadian series that I stumbled upon uh, years ago was called Travelers and it starred Eric McCormick from Will and Grace. But about uh, time travel, these people are traveling back in time to try to stop something from the future, but you know, they, they have, you know, it's, it's very convoluted because you only travel back in time with your consciousness and then you inhabit somebody else's body. So you don't look like you, but you do look like you very confusing in some ways. Uh, and then of course there was another, uh, I'm trying to remember another sci-fi one that is driving me nuts that it is not in my brain and I'm never going to figure it out while we're on the air. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, it starred Michelle Ryan who had the, the, the short lived, uh, I think that was her, the short, no, it wasn't Michelle Ryan, short lived bionic woman series, which was pretty great as well, but I will oh, figure it out by, by, the, by the time the, uh, the series is over. There was another sci-fi one that I really loved uh, about time travel in the future. So the CBC, I think has some underrated stuff but we hear about the BBC because we've got you know PBS, we've got AMC that's playing BBC stuff, and there seems to be like an expectation of oh, this is like masterpiece theater style stuff. So like we we see we watch um, you know, da- Downton Abbey, and uh, you know, we've seen more British shows like Doctor Who or our play here as, as big deals. But for some reason, the Canadian network and the Canadian shows don't get that same level of attention and I think that's starting to change maybe the CW doing the summer stuff but Mm -hmm. there's a lot of really interesting uh, shows out there that I now feel I have an entire different uh, mind to start digging in for new series and sometimes it's really fun to just stumble across something and and see how it goes so I will keep you all updated on my watch through of Burden of Truth it lasted four seasons Uh, it is available if you have your Hulu subscription you're going to have to search for it because it's not going to pop up on your just, uh, you know, the most watched or anything like that. So you'll have to search for Burden of Truth. Uh, but it's a lot of fun. And if you like legal dramas, I highly re- recommend checking it out. And this, I guess this is a legal drama duo uh, or legal, du- legal duo, because I guess Night Court legal is duo, not a drama. Yeah. Sure. Legal that duo. Uh, and of course, check out Night Court Tuesdays and then Wednesdays streaming on Peacock as well. So that was my weekend. Lots of uh, legal dramas and legal comedies. So I guess maybe I am using my paralegal certification. So don't worry, <laughs> mom and dad, that money totally went to good use. 100%. <laughs> and that is the A side. All right. <laughs> so like you said, Adam, <laughs> excuse me, uh, it's double the legal trouble, I guess. you. Could... Yeah, double legal trouble. Or legal, legal I don't know an L word for two. No. I'm sure there is one. And I'm sure one of our <laughs> listeners overseas is is yelling at their their podcasting device right now, the word that I'm supposed to be using. But uh, <laughs> we'll figure out the, we'll call it the legal luo. Legal luau. There we go. The legal luau. Oh, no. Yeah. So this week we are talking about Joseph Edward Duncan. Joseph Edward Duncan was born in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And he ended up growing up in Tacoma, Washington, and had a criminal history that dated back to when he was about 15 years old. In 1980, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison for sexually assaulting a boy in Tacoma. And as a result, he spent all but eight years of his adult life in prison. Wow. He was paroled in 1994, but as tends to happen with career criminals, he ends up right back in prison in 1997 for violating the terms of his parole. So again, Joseph is a career criminal, but we are going to focus on one of his crimes in particular. Okay. Okay. So on May 16th of 2005, authorities go to a home in, I'm going to say this wrong, Port Delaine. Port Delaine. Port Delaine. Port Delaine. Very nice part of Idaho. Yeah. Not far from Spokane. My my people out there tell me they've got some really posh areas like doctors will have their vacation house up in Coeur d'Alene and be a doctor in Spokane. Oh, okay. Mm, fancy. So um, authorities discover several bodies in a home in Coeur d'Alene in Idaho. It's the bodies of Brenda Groney, her son Slade, and her fiance, Mark McKenzie. So we're going to go back to what happens before authorities find the bodies. And we get this from Sashta because when authorities arrived at the house and they found the bodies, they realized two people were missing, Dylan and Sashta. So this is what uh, Sashta tells investigators. 
she mm-hmm. tells them that her mom, Brenda, came into her and Dylan's room and woke him up in the night and said that someone's in the house. So they're trying to sneak out and they, they're trying to escape and they go through the living mm-hmm. room where they see Joseph Duncan in the living room wearing black gloves and a gun. So while pointing the gun at the family, he ties up Brenda, Mark, and Slade. He then takes Sashta and Dylan from the house and he puts them outside. What this family doesn't know is that Joseph, Dylan, had stalked this family for several weeks, watching their comings and their goings and, and learning their patterns. He had like driven by randomly and seen uh, Sashta and Dylan outside playing and became obsessed with them. Oh, jeez. So Sasha and Dylan, again, they're on the front lawn and they're outside when they hear multiple thumping sounds coming from inside. Sasha says she then saw her brother stumbling from outside, from inside the house to the outside of the house. Well, while her brother is stumbling and fighting for his life coming outside the house, Joseph Duncan is inside and he's got a blunt object where he is um, hit Brenda and her fiance Mark and he's beat them to death. Fortunately, Sasha and Dil- uh, Dylan do not see this. Unfortunately, Joseph Duncan follows Slade outside and he does beat him to death as well. I think they do see that. This guy wastes all his bullets. This is a very strange series of events. He shoots yeah. them many budgets. I, I don't I don't get it either. And then you know, Slade. Uh, is 13 so maybe he just more stronger than what he was thinking you know thir- young 13 strapping boy yeah adrenaline kicks in you never know what yeah. you can do yeah so Dylan who's 9 and Sasha who's 8 were then uh, taken and put in his van and he takes them to another location where he repeatedly assaults and tortures them for weeks. Sasha states that they drove a long distance and stayed between two different campsites where he told her that he had beaten her family to death with a hammer. Goodness. You know, there's a massive search for, for Dylan and Sasha after authorities enter the home and they find that they're not there. There's an amber alert that's issued. Uh, there's searches of the area. Um, of course, investigators ruled the death in the homes as, as autopsies. I mean, as homicides, autopsies determined blunt force trauma to the head. But they also noticed that the victims had been bound. So seven weeks pass. And in the early morning hours of July 2nd of 2005, Sasha, looking as if she hadn't bathed in days, was seen at a Denny's restaurant in Coeur d'Alene <laughs> in the company of an unknown man. A waitress, a manager, and two customers recognized Sashta from media reports. The waitress, the server, immediately notifies the manager, who then calls police. And what they do is they position themselves in the door to prevent Joseph Duncan from leaving. Police arrive at the restaurant and they arrest Joseph Duncan without incident. Sashta identified herself to the server at the restaurant and to authorities, and she was taken to the Kunta Medical Center for treatment and um, to be reunited with her biological father. Where initially, when the girl, the kids were were said to be missing, the first person they went and checked with was their father, Steve Grony, who lives in yeah. and he's like, no, they they were at home with with their mom. I mean, so many times it is it is the other parent in situations mm-hmm. like that. So, you know, it makes sense that that's the first place that authorities would check. Mm-hmm. So Joseph Duncan is detained on kidnapping charges and on an outstanding federal warrant. So again, it's Sashta and it's Joseph that were seen in, in Denny's, which means we're still missing a child. Where's Dylan? So at this point, authorities are kind of giving up on the hope of finding Dylan alive. They asked the public for tips, specifically about sightings of a stolen red Jeep Cherokee with Missouri license plates that Joseph was driving at the time of his arrest. Authorities also discovered that Joseph had rented a car in Minnesota and had never returned it. 
a gas station employee in Kellogg, Idaho, which is about 40 miles east of Coeur d'Alene, recognized that vehicle as one that had stopped at her station hours before Joseph was arrested. The employee um, suspected that the little girl that was wandering around the station might have been Sashta, but she didn't confront her because nothing really appeared out of the ordinary at the time. So it was like, well, it kind of looks like her, but she's not acting suspicious. So I'm just not going to raise a stink, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. If you see this child, look, as a mom, I wouldn't want the police called on me, but if that was my child, please call the police. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's sorry, right? And people don't often want to involve themselves and, you know, do the wrong thing, but sometimes doing nothing is the wrong thing. So the employee told her manager and they reviewed the surveillance footage on the camera and they noted that it was, in fact, Joseph Duncan and Sasha in the video. Sasha told police that Joseph had shot Dylan to death in front of her. It was with Shasta's help that investigators were able to dig more into Joseph's past, which revealed more child victims. On July 4th of 2005, <clears throat> excuse me, investigators found human remains at a remote shift camp site in Lolo, Lolo National Forest near St. Regis, Montana. Those remains were sent to the FBI lab in Quantico for DNA testing and were positively identified as those of Dylan Groney. Oh. During the trial, just like Sasha, Sasha said, it came out that Joseph Duncan shot Dylan point blank range by holding a shot off shotgun, shotgun to him. Oh, jeez. Joseph Duncan swears after he's arrested and 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 charged with Dylan's murder. He swears it was an accident. He says initially Shasta was standing on the other side of his Jeep when Sasha heard a loud boom. She runs to the other side of the Jeep and she sees Dylan laying on the ground screaming. Joseph was digging through a clear plastic box looking for a beer when the shotgun went off, hitting Dylan in the stomach. That's what he claims. Shotguns don't normally just go off. Right, right. Sasha said that that's when she actually saw Joseph put the shotgun to Dylan's head and pull the trigger, but it failed to fire. So while Dylan is begging, 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 please, please, please don't do this, he reloads it, does it again, and this time Dylan is killed. According to Sasha, immediately after killing her brother, Duncan starts crying and told her that he only killed him to put him out of his misery. And again, with the help of um, Sasha, they start to dig into his past and they find out there are more murders that he was he committed. Um, and we're not going to get into all those. He also uh, is responsible for the death of Anthony Martinez and Sammy Joe White and Carmen Cubas. With Sasha's help and the digging, they were able to find those bodies. Their skeletal remains were all found and Duncan confessed to the killings. So he ends up convicted in three different courts. He's convicted in Idaho District Court for the kidnapping and murder of Brenda and Slade Groney and Mark McKenzie. The United mm -hmm. States District Court of Idaho for the killing of Sasha, or excuse me, for the kidnapping of Sasha and Dylan Groney and the murder of Dylan Groney and a California Superior Court for the kidnapping and murder of Anthony Martinez. I know, this is a lot. So on January 18th of 2007, he is finally indicted by a federal grand jury in Coeur d'Alene on 10 counts of kidnapping, kidnapping resulting in death, aggravated sexual abuse of a minor, and sexual exploitation of a child resulting in death, and other crimes related to illegal firearm possession and vehicle theft. He's arraigned. And a judge orders him to stand trial the following March. His defense attorneys immediately request a postponement, a postponement which was granted uh, the week the trial was originally scheduled to begin, and a new trial date is set for the following January of twenty of two thousand eight. On December third of two thousand seven, Joseph Duncan pleads guilty to all ten charges against him. As a condition of the agreement, Sasha Groney does not have to testify in the penalty phase of the trial. Due to a gag order, other details of the plea agreement are not released. So election for the penalty phase of uh, Joseph Duncan's federal trial began April 14th of 2008. During jury selection, 
Duncan dismisses his attorneys and chooses to represent himself. His attorneys object, asserting he is not competent and request a formal hearing to, uh, uh, to that issue. So they order an evaluation to, turn, to, turn, to determine his competence and they accept the evaluator's conclusion that he is in fact competent and can proceed without counsel. Wow. Why do these crazy guys always want to represent themselves? <laughs> right? I mean, I, I say that, and then like there's a little voice in my brain that goes like, well, you'd probably think about it. No. Because I, I you know some people like, I could do better. Hmm. I've seen a lot of law, law and order. I've watched a lot of a lot of law and order and and um what's the uh oh goodness, Matlock. Matlock, hey, Matlock, the thing is, you always gotta, you don't have to defend your guy, you just have to find who really did it to get them to confess <laughs> on the stand, and then boom, your guy gets off. Then your guy gets off, right? Yeah. On August 27th of 2008, after three hours of deliberation, the jury recommends the death penalty, and the, the judge imposes three death sentences for kidnapping resulting in death, sexual, sexual exploitation of a child resulting in death, and the use of a firearm in a violent crime resulting in death all related to the death of Dylan Groney. On November 3rd of 2008, uh, Joseph Duncan is sentenced to an additional three consecutive terms without parole in federal prison for the kidnapping of Shasta Groney and for sexually abusing both Shasta and Dylan. Now we talked about the federal, but we need to talk about Idaho. So uh, Joseph Duncan first appears in the Kootenai County Court on July 13th of 2005, where he's charged with three counts of first-degree murder and three counts of first-degree kidnapping, all in conjunction with the deaths of Brenda and Slade Groney and Mark McKenzie. So initially, the, the prosecutors planned to charge him with the kidnappings of Shasta and Dylan, but then they deferred those charges to the federal courts, which we just talked about. Okay. The trial is, I just wanted to get that out of the way so you know justices. Yeah. Um, the trial. Yeah, I'm sure there was a lot of negotiations over jurisdiction. Where can we prove what? Who's yeah. got the right judge? Right. So trial set to begin January 17th of 2006, but you know, like they do, uh, it's delayed till April 4th after a district judge granted a request for defense for more time to prepare. And then again, it was deferred to October 26th after the judge in the case stated, quote, no one wants this case uh, no one wants to try this case twice, including me. His attorneys blame the multiple postponements on the prosecution's insistence on pursuing the death penalty. Okay, so April 16th of 2006, there's a short jury selection. Um, and then Coons and I prosecutors and Joseph Duncan's attorneys reach a plea bargain in which he pleads guilty to all state charges against him. He was immediately sentenced to three consecutive life terms without the possibility for parole for the three kidnapping charges. Uh, sentencing on the murder charges uh, continued pending on the outcome of the federal trial of the kidnapping and murder charges. So over two years later, after being sentenced to death on federal charges, Kootenai County sentenced Duncan to three additional life terms. Duncan also agreed to co cooperate with the Kootenai County Sheriff's detectives investigating his crimes and to provide passwords to encrypted files that he had on his computer. So oh, wow. uh, we kind of did that, you know weirdly but there's a lot of jurisdictions you can't you know the, I'm sure there's a lot of things happening so currently at different times and, uh, it's a lot to got to keep track of i almost feel like we're charlie day with his big board with the, you know, <laughs> the string going Wait, from one thing the to the other yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm um, totally following all of <laughs> on january 8th 2007 the same day that Joseph Duncan was indicted in federal court, Riverside County officials announced that he was charged with um, with the murder of uh, Anthony Martinez. Despite attempts by Riverside County officials to extradite Joseph Duncan to California, including an appeal by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, oh. the federal trial proceeds. He's eventually extradited to California on January 24th of 2009 five months after being sentenced to death in federal court. On March 15th of 2011, he pleads guilty to the murder of Anthony Martinez and he's sentenced to two life terms on April 5th of 2011. As part of a plea deal, that sentence came without the possibility of parole or the right to appeal. Duncan could have faced separate death, a separate death sentence in addition to the ones he already had been sentenced to in federal court 
But Riverside County District Attorney Paul Zellerbach justified the life sentence by saying that he had consulted with the Martinez family who wanted closure in the case and that the federal system would kill him long before the state of California would have seriously considered it. So prior to his arrest, Joseph Duncan had a website. It was a personal website called The Fifth Nail. And apparently, in addition to the four nails used, this is this is lore, this is folklore, in mm-hmm. addition to the four nails that were used to pierce the body of Jesus Christ in his crucifixion, there was a fifth nail that was taken away and hidden by Romans. Joseph Duncan adopted that name for his own website and blog. On the website, which talked about his day-to-day life as a convicted sex offender, he denied being a pedophile and claimed to have been sexually abused as a child. After he was put in prison, he had a blogspot website titled Joseph E. Duncan III returns to the web from federal death row to expose the meaning of the fifth nail. You need a shorter title, dude. So he clearly does not have a background in marketing. No, not at all. All the content on the website was posted by someone called Silenced, who apparently allegedly received letters from Joseph Joseph Duncan for them to post on the site on his behalf. Mm-hmm. I bet he did. Right. In Kootenai County, Joseph's public defender, John Adams, and prosecutor Bill Douglas declined to comment on the possibility that Joseph was blogging from prison himself. Inmates are not supposed to have access to the internet. And while outgoing letters are scanned for contrabands, they're not really read word for word. Yeah. I mean, I could, I could, you need an entire staff of people. I mean, just logistically, it would be insane to be reading every letter that comes in. Right. In October of 2020, Joseph Duncan underwent brain surgery after he was diagnosed with a, a glioblastoma. He declined any treatment and he rejected chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Medical staff at the Federal Bureau of Prisons estimated he had about six to 12 months to live. That was in 2020. He died March 28th of 2021 at the age of 58. His body was cremated. And that is the story of Joseph Edward Duncan. It's kind of crazy to think that if he'd wanted treatment, even though he's on death row, right? he would have gotten treatment. They want to kill you. They want to take you out. They don't want you to die on your own. Uh, I guess. But like, if, if you just don't have insurance, nah. Right. So that's a little, little, little bit of a weird thing about you know our wonderful medical system, where we in the U.S. spend more than any other country on Earth, and also get the least back for our money. Mm-hmm. A couple of things. Sashta is grown up now. She's married with children. Uh, in 2016, when she was 19, she started a, p- a petition called Slade and Dylan's Law in honor of her two brothers. In the petition, she stated that. Convicted sex offenders should not be let out of jail. This would effectively mean that the three strike rule for violent offenders could be reduced to one strike. By the time the petition closed, it had 51,820 supporters. You should know that the jurors who imposed the death penalty on Joseph Duncan were offered counseling in order for them to cope with the horrific evidence that they had to see during the trial. Among the evidence was a 33 minute video depicting a nude Joseph torturing physically and verbally and sexually assaulting a nude and restrained young boy who was identified as Dylan Crowley. Good God. I don't know how you read it. I know it's your job as a citizen to serve in a jury, and but how do you yeah, I think it would take a lot more than counseling. Yeah. Yeah. But he is uh dead i was gonna say he's in prison no he has been locked up and now he's gone and justice i guess you could say served is it really ever served though in a situation like that no i don't think justice this is the word there there were consequences but i don't know if there's any justice consequences for her he did receive consequences for his action how about that because justice yeah because family is not coming back no, and and Sasha, the one survivor, who's had to live with all that. I mean, as evidenced by the petition, is still something that I'm sure she thinks about often. Often, and ha- I mean, how can she not? Her family is gone. Her entire family, except for her biological father. Oh, <sighs> there you go. 
that is the story of the Drone family and unfortunately the man they cross path, paths with, Joseph Edward Duncan, and that is the B-side. All, all, all because he was just driving through the wrong neighborhood and, and became obsessed with two kids. Yeah, it's wild. Yeah. Wild. Uh, don't forget, we do have a Patreon. Yeah, yeah we got a Patreon. Uh, check that out. We've got uh, our website, asidebsidepodcast.square.site. Uh, on there, you can get access to all of our episodes, including uh, two previous episodes that touched on Night Court that I mentioned on the A-side today. Uh, also, all of the sources, uh, all of the research that we do, all of the articles that we find to talk about these things are available on uh, the website for each article as well. Uh, there's keywords on there that can help you find certain things, links right to uh, the full text of, of articles and things if you want more detail. Uh, or if there's something you're like, wait a second, what years did Burden of Truth really run, Adam? I can find out <laughs> just by clicking that link in case I said mm -hmm. it correctly. Uh, you can also buy merch on our website. Uh, we uh, have coffee mugs, which I bought some coffee mugs to take to the restaurant that I work at, my fun job, and because we didn't have any coffee mugs. And evidently, Brooke is a little too good at designing coffee mugs because <laughs> I brought in three and one is left because two have been stolen. <laughs> so I'm, I'm about to have a B-side on who's stealing our coffee mugs uh, because of the art. But I think that's a great, I mean, if they say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, I think like larceny is the second most sincere. Right, right. Because, right. because if somebody's drinking out of a coffee cup, and let me tell you this, it is not gourmet coffee. <laughs> it is. like when somebody's like oh, i'd like some coffee i was like cool that's gonna be black that's all we got. we got we got we got black coffee it comes in a white cup that's basically it but we got a couple cups that got cool design so people are, are not stealing the coffee cup because of the coffee they're stealing it because of the graphics and uh, I'm, I'm i'm beside myself but also super excited i'm like man they must love our podcast and i was like no nah, they just love the garden because it's really clever right? so you can check out all those designs and if you're listening to this podcast and you stole those coffee cups uh each of those designs that you stole is available and also in a t-shirt or a sweatshirt or you can get on a shower curtain if you want so if you like it that much just check it out in the uh in our store on aside bside podcast that square that site uh you can buy brooklyn coffee um uh, so if you you know want her to drink coffee out of a mug that you've stolen mm -hmm. uh, you can just go to buy her buy buy me a coffee.com and put it inside mm -hmm. b-side podcast and buy her a coffee out there uh, make sure you like subscribe share us on the socials uh give us feedback uh things you want to hear uh shows that like if you have a favorite canadian broadcasting company show that is streaming that you're like adam why haven't you binged this one yet why haven't you talked about it uh send send me a link if you got a mystery or a true crime story in your neighborhood uh it's a this is another one with I Brooke did I don't think realize this, but I was out, you know, my my fa I got family out of Spokane or Spokane. I'm not sure which one it is. Uh, so this feels really weird because I was just out there for Thanksgiving. Oh, that is. And weird. so it feels a li little little too close to, to home that uh, you know my my brother who lives out there, uh, he, he often has uh, works work things happening in Coeur d'Alene. So uh, very creepy. So I'm sure if when they hear this though they'll be familiar with that story as well at least know somebody who is uh so if you have uh, stories that you think we should check out or other tv shows let us know and uh yeah i think i rambled a lot and got all of the things on my checklist i think you covered it all all right well episode 122 in the books yeah and uh hopefully uh, we'll be back next week for 123 one two three that, isn't that like a Jackson Five song. Uh huh. It's easy as one. Yeah. Two, three. A B C. Yeah. See, I knew. All right. Can't sing anymore. We're gonna get sued for. Oh. Uh, we're gonna have to pay for. Uh, we're gonna have to pay for rights because that was right. clearly the exact the exact tune, and we were so on key. <laughs> so they're gonna, that's gonna the bots are gonna flag that one. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Adam. Thank you, brother.